Awesome. Guess we'll get going here. My name's Tyler Falk. I own East Coast Avalanche Education. We're super excited to have Sahan Villamoria with here, us here tonight. Sahan's a fully certified IFMGA guide, has numerous first ascents and speed records in the mountains, but possibly most well known for his role as the lead guide with TGR, possibly most uh, notably for hire with Jeremy Jones. You might remember the classic otter body descent. He's also the founder of Samsara Experience, an online training program for athletes to train at their highest levels using the full spectrum of training. Sahan's a father of two, one of the most respected and influential mountain guides of our time. I want to thank Sahan in advance for sharing what he's learned about training in the mountains and bringing this knowledge to our East Coast community. Thanks, Sahan. Right on, Tyler. Thank you. Um, for those who don't know, I actually have roots in the East Coast. I um, lived on the North Shore and skied a lot in Vermont. I was a Mad River Pass holder for many years, and I have very fond memories of um, really branching out into the backcountry uh, around Mount Washington in my early years. So it's super fun to me for me to reconnect with with you and and some of that audience and hopefully share some valuable uh, training advice. That's awesome. Thank you. Okay, right on. Well, I'm going to <clears throat> share my screen and um, we can get right into it. Let's see. So here we go. All right, great. So today's presentation is going to last about 20 minutes and we will take questions at the end. So don't hesitate to post any questions in the comments. Um, Tyler's gonna keep track of them and then we'll circle back to them at the end. Um, as Tyler's mentioned, I'm the owner of Samsara Experience. We're an online training business. And we work a lot with big mountain and backcountry skiers. So that season is really ramping up right now, but we also work with uh, runners and climbers and passionate um, adventurers from across the spectrum of sport. But backcountry skiing is really my strongest connection to the mountains. So I'm very keen to share what I've learned through 20 years of testing and study into um, how the human system works and how we can experience our own peak performance in the mountains. For all those who are here today, we have a special code. If you use East Coast Rules 20, you'll get 20% off any training plan or video program in our library. You can just go to samsaraexperience.com and shop away. That ends at midnight tonight. So um, please take advantage of that if you're interested. All right, so what are we gonna cover? We're going to break um, performance down into three buckets. There's the endurance bucket, the strength bucket, and the movement bucket. And we'll start with endurance, and we're going to look at what I believe are the four keys to efficient training. But before we do that, we're going to take a brief look at sort of the study of endurance, how endurance works. And what I really want to do is help you to better understand the physiological processes that are happening in your own body. And I think that will really enhance your ability to maximize your training. Then we'll talk about strength and common mistakes of strength, the ways in which we can vary strength, and ultimately what the three keys are to um, uh, what I believe to be peak strength training. And then lastly, we'll look at movement, which is perhaps the most complex and hardest to understand component um, of training. And we'll break that down and look at our athlete IQ training method and where that comes from. All right, let's get into it. So let's look at endurance training first. Let's uh, come up with some definitions of endurance training that um, hopefully will make sense. So simply put, endurance is the ability to go far with little fuel. And when we look at endurance from the point of view of um the human role, the human history in the animal kingdom, there's probably no species that's better suited to do that than we are. So um, that's really, I think, a, a helpful working definition. And when we think about backcountry skiing, it really makes sense why um, we would prioritize endurance training. 
Secondly, um, endurance training and endurance as a capacity is characterized by low intensity, long duration training. So that's what long days in the mountains feel like. And the question we've got to ask ourselves is how do we train in a way that builds that capacity? And that's going to start to get into some of the common mistakes, I think, that we see with endurance training. And then lastly, endurance is an energy system. <clears throat> and an energy system literally it means it's an engine. And as humans, we have three different engines. Understanding those energy systems, even just on a cursory level, is really going to help you to be able to optimize your training. All right, what are energy systems? So, as I said, humans have three different engines or three different pathways that our bodies can turn to to create energy. And just like in the engine of a car, there's a trade off. The more speed we want, the lower the efficiency. And that's a parallel that we'll look at with cars and talk about with our own performance. When it comes to endurance, Endurance is essentially that third engine. It's our slowest engine, but it's also our most efficient engine and the engine that I think, again, sets humans apart, and that's aerobic metabolism. So we've got to really understand aerobic metabolism because aerobic metabolism is the energy system that produces endurance, and that's going to be key for backcountry skiing. So um, I'm not really a car aficionado by any means, but I just think that the parallel between thinking about how a car works and how our bodies work from a metabolic or energy system point of view, so helpful. So how is endurance like a Prius? Well, what are characteristics of a Prius? It gets great miles per gallon. In other words, it's highly energy efficient. It can go very, very far on very little fuel. One of the aspects that's uh, really cool in terms of this analogy is that a Prius sort of has two engines, right? It can operate on gas or it can go electric. And endurance is like that too. We can burn fat or we can burn glycogen. And both, um, can, both can be aerobic, but one is going to be more efficient than the other. Just like in the Prius, one's more efficient than the other. And a third parallel is the energy burns clean. There are no, um, you know, uh, a Prius is generally a pretty uh, kind of low impact car. And when we think of endurance metabolically in our bodies, that's one of the great benefits of endurance is that when you go long and you go slow, you don't get that burning sensation in your muscles. You don't get that accumulation of metabolites that you do get if you try to race your friend up a hill, right? You try to race your friend up a hill, you pin it, you're going to really feel your um, muscles start to burn. And that's one of the advantages of going um, aerobic. You don't have that. But lastly, downside of a Prius is not very sexy. It's not um, going to impress your friends. It's not going to go shooting off the start line very fast. And that, again, is a lot like how endurance is um, and how we should train endurance. So how does endurance work? Well. Now we're going to flip the switch. We were talking about cars. Now let's talk about our own engine. And as we said, uh, endurance it works when we rely on aerobic metabolism. That's our most efficient way of creating energy. And one of the characteristics of using our aerobic system is that it takes a very long time or many, many steps to produce energy. It's not fast. We cannot convert energy um, using the metabolic, the aerobic pathway quickly. We have to be patient with it. That means that if I'm on the skin track and I'm going hard and I'm going fast, then my body's gonna say, hey, if you want energy right now and you want that much of it, I'm gonna need to find a different way to produce that energy. This uh, aerobic system is gonna take too long. But on the flip side, if you allow your aerobic metabolism to be the primary um, producer of energy for you, it's going to be incredibly efficient. Arguably, it's about 17 times more efficient than that energy system where you're panting hard and you're starting to feel um, your muscles burn. If you're in that kind of a state, that's no longer primarily aerobic. Um, so aerobic is efficient. It's going to produce a lot of energy. But as we said, it's going to take a little bit of time to do that. 
Maybe one of the best characteristics of the aerobic system is that the aerobic system is capable of burning fat. And fat exists in huge supply in the human body. Most adults have over 100,000 calories of stored fat, which basically means we can survive a whole month without eating. That's amazing. How can we do that? Because our body, our metabolism slows to the point where we can just burn fat. Well, as endurance athletes, if we can burn fat while we're out in the mountains, then we're going to rely on a massive gas tank. Whereas, again, if we flip the switch, we start going a little bit too hard, then we're going to start switching to that glycolytic engine. And that's going to rely on stored muscle glycogen. We only have about 2,000 calories of that. So take 2,000 calories, compare that to 100,000 calories. You can either operate on a tiny little gas tank. That's going to mean you're going to need to stuff stinker, snicker bars down your throat pretty soon. Or you can rely on a massive gas tank that's going to allow you to just keep cruising and feel really great while you're doing it. So how do we train endurance? Um, with that understanding, I'm going to give you what I believe are my four keys to training endurance. So one is you have to go long. And the reason you got to go long is that endurance is the ability to endure time, right? That's what we are enduring with endurance. It's the ability to repeat the movement, to keep going. So, you know, when Diana Nyad, who um, just made this incredible uh, uh, open water crossing, when she was training, she's going to prioritize going really, really long at least one day a week. So for backcountry skiers, if you live near the mountains, well, that's easy. You're going to slap your skins on. You're going to run up and down um, the mountains, whether that's a ski area or in the backcountry, and get your volume that way. If you don't live near a ski area or you don't live near the mountains, then that one day a week of going long, it could be on your bike. It could be running. And if you're far away from the start of the season, say you're training in the summer, you might even vary it up more. You might swim and do other things because all of those will contribute to your, to your system. But having at least one day a week where you go long is important. Long is going to vary. But what I've found is that if you follow the next three keys, long can be as short as 70 minutes. 70 minutes can constitute a long training session one day a week um, if you follow the next few a piece of guidance. So you want to go slow. We've talked about this earlier that in order to train endurance, you have to rely on your endurance engine and that's your aerobic engine. As soon as you go fast, as soon as you get carried away and you try to start charging out there, you're going to start using your glycolytic engine. That's a different engine. It's like driving an Audi um, when you're trying to perfect your ability to drive a Prius. If you want to get better at driving the Prius, you've got to drive the Prius. You can't drive a Ferrari and then expect that to transfer over. And the same thing goes with our training. If we want to improve the performance of our aerobic engine, we have to use it. And that means going slow. Um, for most adults, if you're wearing a heart rate monitor, you want to be around 135 beats per minute. Um, that's going to vary depending on age and other things. Other ways to measure that are, can you have a conversation? Tyler and I are rolling up the skin track and we're chatting it up, then we're probably at an aerobic pace. But if we're sweating and we're panting and we can only get one or two words out, that's no longer aerobic. Three, this is almost like a hack, if you will. If you learn to implement this into your training, you'll get vastly better outcomes than somebody who's doing training that looks very, very similar, but is missing this key point. And that is to avoid rests. As soon as you rest in training, so let's just say you're out for a trail run and you bump into your buddies on the on the trail and you stop and you chat and you have a sip of water. And then five minutes later, your shoelaces come out and you stop for that again. Every time you stop, you're giving your body a chance to recycle energy without any effort. And that destroys the training outcome. So whether you're going only for 40 minutes because you're short on time and you got to get it in, or you're going for an hour, two hours, maybe even three hours. Ultimately, what matters to your body is how long are you going to ask me to keep going? Not fast, but without rest. And if you get in the habit of lacing up your shoes, buckling your boots, and hitting the skin track or the trail, 
and don't take any breaks. Don't stop because your shoes are undone. Don't stop to chat on the trail. Just keep rolling. You'll notice a massive improvement in your performance. Just try to avoid taking those little rests along the way. If you're ski touring, focus on those transitions. Get those transitions down quick. Don't stop to eat and drink if you don't need to. Keep rolling as best you can. It's going to have a huge impact on your endurance performance. Lastly, train fasted when possible. So I'm going to pause on this one. This is a little bit of a complicated one, but my goodness, if you can start to understand um, the importance of training fasted, it'll really um, improve your performance. So the reason we want to train fasted is because we want to encourage our body to burn fat. And our body is naturally inclined to burn the most readily available fuel. So if you're constantly eating while you're doing endurance training, you're replenishing your stores of muscle glycogen. And those stores make it very easy for the body to tap into and to produce energy using them. So what we want to do is instead of relying on that stored glycogen, we want to rely on fat. If we allow that muscle glycogen to be depleted through exercise, then our body is going to have no choice but to go and find uh, that metabolic pathway that enables fat burning. And once you start doing that, once you start triggering that and encouraging your body to burn fat, what you're going to notice is that 40 minutes, 60 minutes, 70 minutes into your run, hike, bike, whatever it is, you don't feel weak. You don't feel hungry. You don't feel like bonking. You just feel like you're in this amazing, steady state of endurance that could just go forever. And that comes and can be accelerated if you experiment with fasted training. So there could be a lot of questions about that. I don't think I want to get too much into it. Um, but fasted training uh, is something you should be curious about, experiment with. You might still carry food with you so that you're not running the risk of being on the mountains without it. But um, trying to find that magic flow that happens when you're on, the, on a long, slow run without food, it's really worth it. All right. Second part. Now let's get into strength training. So strength is a very different capacity than endurance. Let's talk a little bit about what strength is and what strength isn't. So strength, um, the working definition I'm going to use is our maximum expression of force, okay? Maximum expression of force. And what that means is that improvements in strength should be measured in magnitude. In other words, in amount of force, not in volume. So let's just take a pull-up, right? If on day one of your training cycle, you can do three pull-ups and on day 90 of your training cycle, you can do 10 pull-ups. You improved the number of pull-ups you can do. So you increased the volume of strength that you can produce, but you didn't actually improve the magnitude of strength you could produce. Whereas if you use that same time and you went from being able to do say three pull-ups to at the end of 90 days, being able to do a one-arm pull-up, now you've produced vastly more force. So that difference of magnitude, in other words, amount of force versus how many times you can repeat it is a key distinction because volume, the ability to withstand repeated efforts, that's endurance. We already talked about that. Force or strength is the ability to produce more force, to increase the amount of force. And we're going to talk about why that's key for endurance athletes. And ultimately, strength is like the engine of our movement, right? The bigger the engine, the more force you can produce, the easier it is to execute the same movement. Um, so, all right, let's get into how we can um, improve performance through strength training. I think of strength like a reservoir. It's like a huge, it's like a bucket. And um, the more you train it and develop it, ultimately, the less you use proportionally. So what do I mean by that? I'm going to give you an example. So let's go to a classic strength training move for skiers, which would be a single leg step up. So you've got your foot, one foot on a box, you've got a weight in one hand, and you're going to lift yourself up on that foot. And you're going to kind of 
climb up onto the box and then lower yourself back down, right? So that's a single leg step up. And imagine that um, you weigh 150 pounds and on day one of training, you can do that move with 50 pounds. So that means um, the most <clears throat> force you can produce in a single leg step up is your body weight plus a 50 pound weight, that's 200 pounds. Let's just say for argument's sake that you could strength train and increase your body's ability to do a step up from 200 pounds to 300 pounds. So now you're able to do that same move, but you can do it with an additional 150 pounds of weight. So you got stronger, you were able to produce more force. Well, now when you go and hit the boot pack or you're front pointing up a couloir, you're carrying your body weight at 150 pounds, but you're able to do 300 pounds of lifting. So each step is now only half of your body's total ability. Whereas before it was around 60 or 70%. So if you can make each and every step that you take in the mountains easier by 20 or 30%, you improve your endurance without doing any endurance training. You make each and every move that you make in the mountains just that much easier. And the sensation that you have in your body when you're walking up a mountain is just like, this feels really pretty easy muscularly i just feel strong like this does not feel hard so the more you have the lower the proportion of your total that you're using when you're in the mountains and you know i train a lot of runners um and i'm i, I love to run and when we compare running with backcountry skiing running is a very elastic sport your foot hits the ground and it bounces off and you're only on the ground for a split second Whereas in skiing, you've got to drag your boot, your ski, your binding, your skin. You got to drag that up. Then you got to stomp it into the snow and then you got to press up onto it. So your foot's going to be on the ground while you're pressing up for maybe two or three seconds. And it's going to have to make a big movement, a big stepping up movement because we're always going uphill. And I'm dragging around quite a lot of weight. So all of that makes backcountry skiing a much more strength intensive sport than say trail running is. So strength training has an outlandish, a really big effect on backcountry skiing in a way that I don't necessarily see in all other sports. More strength, as we talked about, equals less effort on every step in the mountains. All right, so there's my case for how strength can improve your performance in the mountains. Now, there's so many different ways that you see people training strength, and one can get very lost in all of that. I want to synthesize it down because ultimately, when you strength train, you got three volume buttons. You got three ways that you can manipulate your training. You can manipulate how much you do, how many times you do a movement, how long your session lasts, just the volume of movement that you do. That's one variable you can control. Another variable you can control is intensity. How hard do you go? How hard is each single movement? Because if it's pretty easy, but the fatigue accumulates after a long time, that starts to sound like endurance. But if it's very, very hard from the second you go, that's more like strength. And then thirdly, frequency how often you strength train. So if you train wicked hard with huge volumes, but you only do it one day a week, I think science would say you're not making the most of it. And what I would argue, and I'm, I'm going to walk you through here, is that the volume should be low, the intensity should be high, and the frequency should be high. If you keep intensity high, if you keep frequency high, your volume can be surprisingly little. Your session length can be surprisingly short. The number of reps you do can be surprisingly low. All right. Here's one question that I think you should ask of your strength training to determine if it's useful from my point of view. Does my strength training develop a capacity that A, benefits my target sport? Because, hey, if the strength training doesn't transfer to better performance in the mountains, then what's the point? So it's got to benefit my target sport, but B, it should not be a capacity that my target sport develops naturally. Because if my target sport develops it, then why am I doing the supplemental training in addition? That doesn't make sense. So when we find things that can make us better at our sport, 
but doing more of our sport doesn't necessarily get us there. That's really worthwhile training because it benefits our sport and we can't get it any other way. That's how strength training should be. It should benefit your sport and it should not be the same as your sport. So when I see people doing 15, 20, 30 step ups, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down on a box, I'm thinking that's not strength training. The load is too low. Um, and that starts to look a whole lot like walking around in the mountains, taking hundreds of steps accumulated over time. We don't want our strength training to look the same as our sport. It should be much, much harder and much, much shorter. So um, my recommendations, keep your intensity high, keep your volume low. Um, in other words, don't ski indoors. Don't try to make your strength training look like skiing. Um, it's better for you to go into the mountains or go onto the trail to get that type of adaptation and then keep your intensity high for your indoor session. Um, I love this quote from my friend, Steve Bechtel, anything more than eight reps is Zumba. Um, and that kind of sums it up. You know, we want to be doing things that are extremely hard so that we can't do that many of them. Okay, so the common mistakes, again, volume is too much. People are spending too long in the gym. They're doing too much accumulated work. And the reality is that if you're a skier and you are skiing, you are fatigued. I'm tired all winter long. Every day is this sort of delicate balancing act of keeping it together uh, and not overly fatiguing myself. So my strength training sometimes will be like eight minutes long, 10 minutes long. Uh, even five minutes long, because I don't want to accumulate a whole bunch of fatigue. I'm already tired as it is. Um, the intensity commonly I find when I look at what people are doing, it's not hard enough. And if you're, the intensity isn't hard enough, you simply won't trigger the changes in your body. Your body is not going to care to make adaptations to something that's easy. So if it takes you one, two, five repetitions before it gets hard, then you're not going hard enough. It should be hard right from the get-go. Frequency, lastly, I think there's a lot of great research right now that's really pointing to the idea that frequency is something that we can use to our advantage. Train very frequently, but just keep the sessions very short. Better to train three, four, five days a week for eight to 10 minutes a session than to train for an hour, one session a week. Okay, we covered that. Okay, let's see. So in conclusion, strength training, three keys to strength training. Um, low reps, hard from the start. In other words, high level of effort, high intensity. And lastly, high frequency, three times a week, I think at a minimum. Um, you might even choose to do it four or five days a week, just keeping those sessions very, very short. Okay, last part of this presentation is movement training. And movement training is something that you don't commonly find in training methodologies. And this has really been my passion. This is um, where I've invested the most energy and what I really think is the next dimension in training. Um, this, I believe, is sort of the next frontier and what can take ordinary athletes make them extraordinary without just practicing their sport. I mean, obviously we practice our sport as much as we can, but um, if that's the only way we can improve, our improvements can be very limited. Our sport's seasonal, right? Um, we only get to do it maybe a third of the year. So what are the things that we can do to enhance our performance without actually doing our sport? That's an important question. In other words, can we get better at skiing without skiing? I think so. Um, and here's some of the conclusions that I've come to around movement training is that, you know, about 10 years ago, when I really started studying movement, I looked at movement very broadly. I looked at basketball, I looked at martial arts, I looked at all the mountain sports, um, that I practice. I looked at dance. And the question I kept asking myself is what's the thread that connects all of the movement? Is there even a thread? Is there something that all these sports have in common? And ultimately, I found that, yes, there really is. We're going to look at what those are. 
And when you find those things, you it's like a tree. And you can spend a lot of time studying a tree by just looking at the tree, or you can go down, dig in the dirt, and look at what the roots tell you about the tree. And that's sort of the parallel that I see in training, is that a lot of people are still training. They're trying to cultivate the tree, meaning their body, their athleticism, by watering the leaves, by practicing the sport, by just mimicking the way that you want to perform in the mountains. And what I've really come to understand is that the way to improve athleticism isn't to focus on that one sport. It's to get back to that thread that connects all sports, the roots of our athleticism. And in that analogy, my, um, my comment is water the roots. If you want to grow the leaves, you got to water the roots. So what's at the roots of our athleticism? That's a really important question. And what I come up with is that human specific training is more important than sport specific training because sport is just a representation of the way that we as modern athletes have found to use our athleticism in a way that's fun but ultimately it all comes from this human design two arms two legs and the way that we're built when we get back to training from that human design you're going to find that your training doesn't just make you better at skiing. It makes you better at everything. All of a sudden, you're more confident as soon as you hop on a skateboard. You take that surf trip to Mexico and you pop up quicker and you're on the rock and your brain and body are better able to problem solve climbing and you've got better spring in your step when you're running. I believe all of those things can be developed simultaneously. Oh, and he wants to show it to us again. All right. So... What are some things that all sports have in common? Um, the, this is really the product of my 10 years of looking at um, training from the movement perspective. One is reciprocity. Take this as an example. When you skin, when you ski tour, and you stride forward with your right foot, you always plant your left pole. And when you stride forward with your left foot, you always plant your right pole. You won't see anybody on the skin track going left foot, left hand doesn't work that way. Our bodies have a natural design that causes us to want to reciprocate. So when the lower body does something in a left side direction, your upper body is going to counter that in the right side direction. Go pull up any photo of a top sprinter running on a track. When their left knee is driving and lifting, their right hand will be doing the same thing. You'll never see them go left, left, right, right, because they would literally run around in circles. Um, that reciprocity concept is baked into human design. It's baked into the way that we operate in sports. You know, like when you drive really heavy onto, onto your downhill edge, you want to bring your upper body down the fall line. So as your hip is falling back, your shoulders are falling forward. That's an example of that reciprocity in downhill skiing. Or like we talked about in ski skiing, when I'm driving forward with my left foot, I'm going to plant my right pole. Number two, elasticity. Um, too much strength training that I see out there is slow and heavy and mechanical. But sport is fast, reactive, agile, involves rebound. We have to build that elasticity into the way that we move. And we can do that indoors in a way that's going to transfer to the way that we perform outdoors. And lastly, we've got to learn to be reactive because sport, natural sports that we're into, climbing, skiing, running, all those things, we got to react to our environment, changes in the shape of the terrain, changes in the texture of the snow. Um, we're constantly reacting. So if we don't incorporate some reaction, agility, rebound, change of direction um, into our training, we're not going to see that show up in the way that we move when we're in the mountains. So reciprocity, that left and right side coordination, elasticity, the ability to um, rebound and be quick, and reactivity in response to the environment that we're playing in. All right. So when I was trying to think, how am I going to explain this? I couldn't really come up with a better way than to just show you a video this is from our Athlete IQ series. Um, we have a number of these series, and I just pulled a few different pieces from across our program 
um, to give you a look at some of the ways in which we're problem solving that movement puzzle with training. And this is the last slide I got. So we'll look at this and then close and um, we can chat about any follow up questions. All right, here we go. Okay, I think that was about 30 minutes, so we went over a little bit. Hopefully it wasn't um, wasn't too long. That was great. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Absolutely, Tyler. Couple couple uh, questions. Yeah. Are you seeing the questions in the, in the Google chat? Oh, great. You got a couple there? I got a couple here. Um, what does fasted mean? How long in advance should you not eat? So we can look at that. And curious what you va what value you place on barbell exercises, lunges, step ups, classic lifts like deadlifts. Okay, yeah, we can tackle that. Um, Tyler, did you have any questions before I? I had one other uh, that came in. Stu Johnson asking a question about how do you mentally prepare. Uh, what steps do you take to build that mental strength and mental stamina for long duration objectives? Love that question. I think, you know, for me, this is a, a bigger conversation that I didn't really get into in this. In, uh, that's sort of part of our like whole mindset curriculum. But what I would say is that training in every way is going to show up in the way that we perform. And so often it seems like athletes are training in a way that's just a grind. And training is an obligation, it's a duty, it's something that I feel really guilty about if I'm not doing. And so when I'm out there, I sort of pat myself on the back for having done it, but while I'm doing it, I'm sort of grinding. I'm really hating it. And I think that mental conversation it really starts to affect the way that we play outside and the way that we connect with nature. So for me, you know, I'm very much into a habits driven way of training rather than like a grind motivation, discipline way of training. I'll give you an example, right? So like I am, I mean, I've been a guide for 20 years and I'm still not a morning person. Like when I wake up in the morning you don't want to talk to me. I'm really grumpy. I'm groggy. It takes me ages to get going. And so traditionally, I've had a really hard time training first thing in the morning. And one of the things that I started realizing is it's because as soon as my feet hit, hit the ground, I anticipate that I'm going to feel a certain way. And I let that conversation play like a movie in my head. Oh my God, I feel so tired. Wow, I'm so groggy. Oh my gosh, I can't wait to have some coffee, all that type of stuff. And one of the things that I've changed is I, when my first alarm goes off, the, the snooze, I lay on my back and before I get out of bed, I start narrating a whole different story. It's a new day. I wonder what this day is going to bring. I'm excited to, you know, in the mornings now I go out and swim. Um, I can't wait to get on my bike. I can't wait to feel the glide in the water. And I just start narrating a whole different story around how my body's going to feel doing these things that usually I just feel really kind of groggy at in the morning. I think that's exactly into that question of the mindset training. Like when we're out there, when we're trail running, when we're swimming, when we're biking, all those things. Sure. It's training. Great. But you know what else it is? It's us time. It's a chance for us to reconnect with nature, to have a little bit of free time, to let the mind wander. That's so much to be grateful for. And allowing the narrative or forcing if you need to force it if you have to force the narrative to be one of like enjoyment of appreciation gratitude and then when you're out 
and you're on, on these long days and yeah, they get hard. Sometimes long days get really hard. You default back to this narrative of like gratitude and appreciation for where you're at rather than, oh my God, this just feels like a grind. For me, you know, I was, I was a competitive athlete in my twenties and thirties. I raced uh, running and ski mountaineering. I came from that very kind of grind type of mentality. And now I'm, I'm not competing as much though. I raced a lot this summer actually, but I have such a different narrative around. It's really changed the game for me. That's a great answer. I love it. Thanks so much. Totally. Um, maybe I'll touch on the fasted question because that's a very common one. So the thing I really want to say about fasted training is there's no rules. There's no rules. There's no guideline that if you meet it, you can say, I did fasted training. And if you didn't, then you're lazy and you didn't. That's not the way I see it at all. Ultimately, the reason that fasted training is so effective is it's because it is part of our evolution. When about 2 million years ago, when humans became hunters, um, we were not the most powerful, not the strongest, and not the fastest. In fact, we were probably the slowest and least powerful of all the animals that we would have hunted. But what enabled us to hunt effectively was the fact that we could outlast our prey. And that ability to keep going when, we, when they were out of fuel and we could keep going slowly is ultimately, some anthropologists argue, what enabled the human species to survive at a time of scarcity. So today, when we start to experiment, and that's the word I like to use here, experiment with fasted training, you start to tap into something that's woven into your DNA for the last few million years. And because of that, when you start to develop it, your body's like, oh, there's a blueprint in me for how to do this. My species, my ancestors did this, and I can develop that capacity. So what you want to do as a modern athlete is you want to gently encourage your body to return to its natural athleticism, something that it's had and still has in it, right? I know an athlete who ran a hundred miler, no food, no water. That seems unbelievable to me. Um, but there you have this example of an athlete who was born with the same you know, capacity as I was, but they gently encouraged their body, experimented with going for an hour and then an hour and a half and two hours without food. And that's ultimately what I've done over the last couple of years. So an easy way to integrate fasted training into your life is to get your endurance done in the morning, because in the morning, you naturally have somewhat depleted muscle glycogen because it's been so many hours since you fueled. So if you fueled at 6, 7 p.m. and then carried on with your evening, you went to bed and you woke up, your muscle glycogen is going to be naturally low. And if you go out and run, hike, bike, whatever you want to do, um, but do it slowly. That's key. That's absolutely key. Faster training is only effective, only safe, only smart, in my opinion, if you're doing it slowly. And what you'll find over time is maybe at first you, you can only run for 40 minutes comfortably before your brain starts to have alarm bells go off that say, I need, I need food. And over time, you start to be able to go for 60 minutes, 70 minutes, 100 minutes. If you're training in the afternoon, in the evening, maybe you try to start by you eat lunch and then no snacks, maybe two or three hours, and then you go for a run. You're already going to start to see a slight depletion of muscle glycogen. Then maybe you get to a point where you experiment with pushing lunch a little bit further back. So there's no rules, but ultimately you want to nudge your physiology in a direction that makes it better adapted to performing in the mountains because big days in the mountains involve maximum aerobic efficiency, which means going far on as little fuel as possible. And then some, one last thing I want to say, when you get home, faster training's over. Now you feast, you eat well eat fully, uh, consume protein, carbohydrates, everything, right? So it's not, it's not fasting for weight loss. It's not, it's not that at all. It's a performance enhancement for endurance athletes. And you want to try to do some of that training in that state and then fuel well afterwards. Excellent. Did we have one more question to cover? Yeah, we got one more question, which is, what do you think about traditional barbell lifts and things like that? So 
my short answer is I don't like them. I don't do them. I don't believe in them. Um, you know, I've spent the last 10 years really trying to get to the heart of movement training and understand human movement. Um, and <clears throat> what I see is no matter what sport you're talking about, any natural sport, all sports come back to locomotion. Locomotion is simply the patterns of movement that humans use to cover ground. And the brain and the body is so programmed to be adaptable. That's why we're having this conversation because training works. If you train, your body will be like, oh, okay, I get it. You're stressing me in this way. I'll adapt in that way. And when you get back to these traditional lifts where you've got two feet flat on the ground and you're just working in this linear fashion up and down, up and down, that doesn't look like human movement. It doesn't look like locomotion. Locomotion is one foot at a time. It involves this left, right side reciprocity we were talking about. So for me, all of training, every single part of training, if you want training to show up in the way you perform in the mountains, then every part of training has got to reflect those innate athletic patterns and doing things like this and like this, that's just mechanical. That's just robotic. And will it make your muscles grow? hundred percent. If you just want your muscles to grow, oh yeah, any of that stuff will work great. But if you want to be an athlete, if you want to perform in the mountains, then your training has got to be connected to the way that you move. And that's called locomotion. Your training has got to reflect that locomotive way of moving. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to, to join this evening. Really appreciate it. Totally. I'm just going to um, wrap up by letting people know how they can train with us if they're interested. So we have three levels of um, three tiers that you can get involved with us. So um, at the start, if you haven't trained with us before and you just want to check out our method, we have training plans for every outdoor sport from big mountain skiing to hard rock climbing, trail running. Um, Return to sport is our uh, program for injured athletes. So we have a number of different programs that you can purchase today. Um, they're 20% off using that East Coast Rules 20 code. Second tier is base camp. That is something that we're trying to develop into a uh, online video library that has all of our content. And that's what you'll find. There's loads of workouts, hundreds of videos. There's rehab content in there. There's educational content. You subscribe, you're a monthly subscriber, you get access to all of it. And then lastly is the athlete team. That's our biggest and best program. Um, we have a community of athletes from around the country and even around the world. Um, that all embark on a 12-week training journey together. And we're just about to open that for the winter season next week. So um, you can just reach out to us on Instagram. Um, you can email wizard at samsarexperience.com. We'll send you more information about that. And that's really integrating community into training. And you have coaching and all the different elements um, all woven in. And it's a really cool place. It's a really cool experience. So those are the ways you can get um, connected to us. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate. Put